Hello, Stephen Alexander here. Hope you're doing well and that you've enjoyed the audiobooks that have been coming out recently. Welcome to this special bonus episode, which will hopefully be the first in a little discussion series called Willow Branches. This little bonus series will be all about making connections, and I plan to talk to a variety of guests about the stories we love. Episodes may pop up now and again, so look out in your feed. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by my boyfriend, Benjamin Callery, to talk about the beautiful illustrations he has done for Willow Audiobooks. So, welcome to this first um, conversation as part of what I think I'm going to be calling Willow Branches. I'm joined today by Benjamin Callery, who's the artist who's done the illustrations for most of the Willow audiobooks so far. Uh, hi, Ben. Hello. Thank you for joining me via the magic of the internet. I don't know uh, how transparent we want to be about how we know each other. Well, what do you think? Quite simply, I'm Stephen's boyfriend. Yay. So, yeah. Um, Thank you for coming on and doing this little conversation. I thought it would be nice to uh, start doing some bonus content to sort of um, talk about the stories that I'm sharing. And I thought a great first place to start would be to talk about these lovely illustrations because they really do, uh, you know, they, they give my whole uh, presence on social media a lift. Um, they, they really eye-catching. They, they draw your attention in, in my, in my view. So thank you for all the beautiful work that you've been doing. I wondered if you could start off by telling us a bit about how you first got into drawing and art and like how long you've been doing that well I've been drawing ever since I could hold a pen as my mum would say and the walls of my first canvas (laughs) um and from then it really became apparent very quickly that it was pretty much I would say the only thing I'm good at because I've worked so I've so very hard on it all through the years, and I just I've kept through it, um, and that's pretty much it. I've been drawing ever since I can remember. But with Stephen's um, covers, I would call them. I've been tr- really pushing my boundaries into a new style, so that's quite fun. Mm, good. Yeah, I was going to come on to ask you about style and things because I would say you you're, you're capable of doing a lot of different things, but you also you have your own style. If you're doing your own artwork for your own purposes, you have a style, don't you? And then there's this, this which you call your children's illustration style. Yeah. Um, can you t- tell us about your your different styles and, and where they come from? Well, if you click on one of the links of Stephen's post on Instagram, you'll find my page and you'll see that it's a little bit sparse, but there are pictures on there that I tend to draw strong women in a very... Stephen says they always look sad, but I think <laughs> they look. I think they look melancholy. I think they look. I think they look beautiful. They're something beautiful in sadness. I think. I know it's a really weird thing to say. Um, throughout history, people have been drawing sad women. I think the Mona Lisa looks sad. So, anywho, that's my style, my personal style, because I really enjoy drawing that. But then, uh, in the past couple of years, I've been really focusing on developing a style to push into the illustration realm and like be like a bit more friendly, like a bit more whimsical and a bit more actually pushing my creativity in a sense. Yeah. I think your children's illustration style, I think uh, you use watercolor a lot, don't you? Yeah. Watercolor is my favorite medium, but not only do I use watercolor with all of the pieces that I've done for Stephen, they have had, I use three mediums. I use watercolor I use Drew and Ink Tense pencils, which people would say is a watercolour, but it's not. It's actually a soluble ink because once it's dry, it's dry. It's not like watercolour where you can pick it back up. And I do most of my backgrounds of those, all apart from Oz, the first Oz. I That was solely watercolour. And then the last one is colouring pencils. And then sometimes I use a little bit of gouache if I want some white highlights, but tend to be I like playing with different textures and that is like the watercolor is like transparent the ink tents you can build up to be really opaque and then the coloring pencils give that I don't know I just love the 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 feeling of coloring pencils on watercolor I just think it gives it a nice difference shall we call it yeah kind of depth and stuff yeah yeah textures and everything no it is it is really lovely and and so do you feel that those things particularly the watercolor do you think that's your your kind of medium um 
yes i think i'm i think i'm the, sh- the strongest when i'm working with watercolor um since i've been doing these audiobooks though like my watercolor pans have taken a hit <laughs> so um i've used a lot of green apparently yeah. because i've had to just have to top up my green but um yeah green is definitely a, a <laughs> prominent color in these yeah, um, yeah i think I, we might know what might be on your christmas list yeah maybe um, <laughs> Do you ever get tempted to try other media? Is there something you haven't really done much of that you'd like to? Um, well, early, uh, earlier this year, I've been experimenting with acrylic, and then I'd like. I, I think a lot of people have been telling me to try oils because it's almost that like acrylicy, well, not acrylic, but it's like it's almost like more watercolory. So I they say that it would probably be more. I'd find it more easier, more I could adapt quicker. Whereas with watercolors, you're so you're so used to it to being so fluid for so long and you've got, and you can pull it back up. That's the best thing about watercolor that you can pull it back up. I can see that as quite an attractive part of working with it. Yeah. But things Flexible. Are, there are some bits that are, I use the transparency of watercolor, but I do really like the intensity that you can build up with watercolor. I do a lot of layers. Mm. Um, as Stephen has been around when I have been drawing and painting, he he can testify that I do a lot of layers. I have a I have an air gun, well, air gun, not a heat gun, that I dry to speed it up. So I do do a lot, and you can layer up watercolors, water, and then using those different tones to to layer up gives you a depth. It's like that. It's like um, when you layer in screens of color, you can build up. You know what I mean when you build up you can build up a depth yeah absolutely by, by layering colors yeah and that's that's what i think the beauty of watercolor is you can do it with um i think the technical term would be called glazing um you can do it with watercolor you can do it with acrylic you can do it with oils most and you can do it definitely do it with coloring pencils so i think that's the technique that i love is glazing because it creates depth mm. speaking of depth the one i always think of and is thus far has definitely been my favorite illustration that you've done for willow um the secret garden um the the depth between the the flowers and the grass in the foreground all the way through to the trees in the background um is just so beautiful um and the composition of the whole thing with with the figure of mary with her back to us um it yeah it's just it's just so well done um such a beautiful illustration it makes you feel like you're really there in the garden in the nature and it's beautiful um so that's that's probably my favorite in terms of it just made me think of it when you were talking about the depth and stuff so that's one where you can really see that's worked really beautifully i i would say um out of them all i've got a, a the two i'm quite connected to um secret garden i agree is my fave my personal favorite um that one came really natural and really easy to me mainly because i love the imagery of the story um the idea of this secret garden just really draws me um and then the next one is actually stephen's christmas thing um which is uh, a christmas carol <laughs> a christmas thing by charles dickens <laughs> <laughs> but um it's a Christmas Carol, and this one, I after much debate with Stephen, we were talking a lot back and forth, as we do with all of them. But this one, I was all set to draw a scene of the story. A Christmas Carol is very different, and it. So I chose, I instinctively chose to not have Scrooge in it. I know that is a bit of a wild statement. But I said to myself, well, Stephen first said, okay, what about the door with Marley's face in it? And I said, I'll try that. So I tried it. And all of a sudden, after I've been doing a few of the compositions of that, I just couldn't get the door knocker right. And suddenly I was like, okay, I'm just going to draw Marley as a ghost and see where that goes. And then all of a sudden I was like, okay, I wanna, I'm going to draw the next ghost and the next ghost and the next ghost. And I was like, okay. And then all of a sudden I thought, well, so why can't I just be like doing like one of those classic covers where you depict um, people in the story rather than a scene? You 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 build up an, an energy of the story. And that's what I tried to do. I tried to be a bit different, a bit um, creative, shall we say, about about the picture. And it is of four ghosts 
coming out of a candle. Mm, no, I love it. I love because I like to, you know, obviously it's it's an interpretation, is it? But I like to imagine that um, Scrooge is sort of holding the candle, um, even though you can't see that, and that these, uh, you know, the lights coming out and it's it's splitting into these different parts that are all sort of connected to try and save him yeah. from himself. And I think that's a very important thing, what you said there. I think like imagery and illustrations and um, movies and all things that we feed on through our eyes, like all these like comics and all that, we as human beings can add to them. We can, we can be like, okay, well, we can't see Scrooge there, but we can, we can think that he is holding it and so forth and so on. Like there's nothing stopping us to saying, what's happening around the picture we've got this small section but what's happening around it what's happening behind that rock or what you've just drawn or cliff or it's all about i think art is about building questions and it's about building um conversational pieces absolutely it's like um you know you go to look at something in a gallery and uh you could stand there for for ages just uh asking yourself questions thinking you know what's going on here and you can have, you can ask one person, then you ask the next, and they're both two different two different ideas. And which, yeah. is, which is the beauty of being human, really, is we all perceive and take in life in different ways, and we just plod on, really. Yeah, you know, I'm just looking at um, I'm looking at the Wizard of Oz one and the Secret Garden one. They both feature um, a young girl uh, with her back to us, um, and uh, I love that because. I think on the one hand, it, because because we're, we're behind her, it's like we get to see her perspective. Uh, it's like we're looking through her eyes almost. But also the fact that you can't see their faces, it means there's so much more empty space there, so much more imagination for you to build the character uh, in your own mind. Um, you know, and you get you see their body language and that tells you enough about the character, but there's there's enough empty space there for it to be open as well, which I love. Yeah, for me, the re- one of the re- big reasons I chose to do, well, I started the first one at Oz. I was like, okay, so Dorothy goes on a big adventure, and this adventure makes her grow and it makes her makes her learn a lot. And I was like, okay, we need to be ready to be going on that adventure with her. That's what the whole idea was. Like, we're we're just about to go on an adventure. We're behind her all the way, and we're just going to go on the adventure with her. And with Secret Garden, it was more of a case we are having a candid look into Mary's world. We are she doesn't know we're there and we're just having a having a peek into her world, discover and her discovering a new a new place. Yeah, simply following two two bright young girls into a story, into their into their brave um adventures that they go on. Yeah. And actually again just looking at it, look at the Secret Garden one, it's 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 cool how, you know, the camera, if you like, or the observer is outside the secret garden looking in, whereas Mary's inside it. It's like we're we're on the outside looking in and we're like you say, we've been granted this peak. Yeah. Um, it's that's really it's it's really captivating. I think that's probably why it's my favourite actually. Just that it's so so enticing. So we've talked a little bit about your technical, um, your media and things like that. Um and we, we've we've also just started to touch a bit on uh, the composition and the concept and the ideas and stuff. But I was just going to ask you in general, when you come to do a new illustration, if it's based on a, a pre-existing story, um, how do you go about that? Where do you start? Well, some people would say that you should start by reading the book. And I would agree. Personally, yes, you should read the book. But... I work full time and I have a finite amount of time. So what Steve, what Steve and me do, Stephen says, okay, so these are the key scenes in the books. And then he will either send me the voice note of him reading it or send me the pages to read. So I get a, I, and then I get an idea of what he's, where I'm going because I get the, a few different scenes. I get to choose pretty much because if it's a scene that I don't think has enough energy, I won't do it. I, the scenes need to be enough energy. And I think that's where I went wrong in Oz a lot, a bit. It's a, it's a nice image, but I think it didn't have enough energy where the other ones have energy, you mean? 
that one has a bit more it's very subdued compared to the other it's quite one. static yeah, yeah. Um, personally i like that I, I like the fact that it's because it's more of a landscape isn't it you've got more of the, the view off to the emerald city in the distance exactly and the thing that i learned with oz is i've never done grass that way and i now do grass every time that way so yeah and i think i'm just looking over to my bookcases and i just was saying like thinking to myself a lot of the books that you see today don't really have scenes on them they have they 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 go for energy more and then captivate and eye catching more than scenes whereas if you think about the classic ones that have scenes are uh, so you've got um Harry Potter which will always have a scene even in the new edition they always got a scene whether we like the new editions is a different story um, because I think the 90s children have a big thing like oh the original covers are the best but but the, the kids today, they're going to grow up with these new covers and they've got, to, they've got to capture that audience, not the audience they had back then. Even though the, the, the 90s children and the people who read them first still love them, they've, they're, they're doing their job by capturing a new audience, but they're still sticking true by doing a scene. Are there any other um, children's illustrators that you particularly admire? Um, so the classic ones are like... Um, Maurice Sedak, I can never get. Oh, Maurice Sendak, the where the world things are, yeah. Yeah, because like I, being a kid of the nineties, I remember that being in the library. I remember reading it, and remember really liking the the because as kids you pick up things that interest you, don't you? And, and, and picture books are so special, aren't they? Yeah, and so like we also like, got the Hungry Caterpillar. Why can't I remember? Eric Eric Carl, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's those books that stick with you forever, you carry with you. Well, I just, I want to say thank you, Ben. Um, Is there anything else you want to say? Just remember that my perception of art and how I do things is not the one way of doing everything. So um, if you are listening to these books and seeing these covers or you say, oh, I really love drawing and find your own path. Literally, it took me 20 odd years to to find my path. I've got a degree, fun fact, not in um, illustration. Yeah, no, I was actually, I was going to ask, actually, you've just reminded me, um, because your degree is in fashion design. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was going to ask how that impacts on your, your drawings, because these... these um, these stories are all obviously they're in the public domain. They're they're not modern stories. Um, so you've I, f- I feel you've used your knowledge of fashion and and the, the wardrobe that these characters would have worn. Uh, I love the dress that Mary's wearing in the Secret Garden, um, and Alice's dress where she's falling down the rabbit hole. So, what I will say as a point of call for anyone drawing clothes, use references. Because at the end of the day, you may think you know what a clothes look like. You do not. I can guarantee, coming from someone who has made garments with a degree and designed hundreds of collections throughout the times, I know that there is more. And the more details, if if you're up close and you're just drawing in our garment and it's quite a simple garment, you've got to make sure that that garment looks proportional. If that, if that garment looks like it's cutting them off at the, in the middle of their belly i don't know and I th- you need to understand proportion because clothes will, they denote they can make someone look shorter they can make someone look taller like fashion is in a lot of ways is an illusion trick so learning learning about um drawing clothes from references drawing clothes from history not just modern um is a very vital thing so my own personal things a lot of my a lot of the stuff I draw it comes from my head but that's because I I I've been drawing clothes for coming up nearly 10 years now uh so I understand somewhat wh- how clothes should look but saying that I still go back to references I still look at references of what is what what fashion looks like in let's say the 18th century 19th century early 1910s um, because the subtle differences between 1910 and 1912 and then 1912 to 1915, there is so many differences because as 
I'm going into fashion history now. No, no, it's fascinating. Go on. But as you as you see time go through history, you see, especially in women's fashion, you see girls pushing the boundaries, not wanting to dress like their mothers, and that really started to come into a, into effect in like the 1918, the early two, the early 1920s. But yeah, so it sounds like um, what you're saying is that uh, you know that that 20th century, early 20th century period it was fashion changes were sort of accelerating um and so that there's a lot of a lot of different variation from from even year to year yeah because you've got to think you've got to think like 1914 would start the first world war exactly yeah and then 1918 at the end so those four years that that war was going on there was there was fabric shortages though and so women had to make they they made a lot of their own clothes um and so that's why fashion changed so quickly in that time mm, i think mm. well it's not the reason why but i think i definitely think the war accelerated it's that. part of it isn't it and yeah. also um the first world war i think changed a lot of um women's role in society and um, society's perception of women didn't it because with the men all having to go off to fight and the women having to hold down the fort um at home yeah um, and, and and do jobs that their husbands would have done before and that kind of thing and um that's that's a very important thing like we, we're not going to digress very much but like um i love it because uh you know i listen to a lot of podcasts and um i normally love it when the people go off on tangents and go down little rabbit holes so yeah and it's it's great that you don't talk to me much about fashion <laughs> so um getting to hear you hear you share your knowledge and your kind of views on on the history um was really interesting i just want to say uh thank you so much ben uh first of all for coming on and uh, having this conversation um, so that we could share with the listeners because uh, I think it's really interesting to hear um, how your how your process works how you go about everything um, so thank you for that um, and also obviously a huge huge thank you for all your beautiful beautiful work that you've done for me um, it's a labour of love isn't it just out of um, the same that that uh, my producing the audiobooks is is um when when you're as as creative as as you and me are um we we both know that our creative pursuits are always going to be a a core part of our lives even if whether we're making money from it or not um so and it's finding a balance isn't it if, um you've got to pay the bills um but uh when you when you have a a real need to be creative um you've got to do that as well for your own sanity yeah um so yeah, uh, what what I'm trying to say is I'm really appreciative of of all the time and effort that you've put into them and the the beautiful work that you've done because as I say, it really really lifts Willow Audiobooks onto a new level. That's no problem. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of um, not being able to make any money from it though, Patreon is a thing. Um, Willow Audiobooks is a creator on Patreon now, um, which you probably you'd know if you've been listening because the last uh, two books I've been um slipping in little um little adverts in chapter breaks to remind you of that fact um if you if you sign up as a patron um you can choose how you want to contribute um anything anything you can give to help us to keep doing this consistently because it is it is a lot of work i again we're talking about this balance I've been trying to work out this balance this year since I started in March. I I started off and I managed to do roughly a book a month and then I had a little bit of a pause um, and then I've I've decided to come back uh, and try to be consistent and the, these last few months of 2020 I've I've specifically done uh, a book a month um coming out week by week. Um I don't know I don't know how realistic that is to to be able to maintain that if I'm not, you know, if we're not um I'm just going to put a 2P in here. Yeah. Stephen puts a lot of time into these audiobooks because he will go over and over and over a line until it sounds perfect. It he will Don't tell them that. I like them to think that I just get it perfect first time. <laughs> but the thing is though he does put a lot of work into this and the the love that he he gets from this is is enough to take him so far but all I'm all all I all I'm trying to say is, uh, you know, if 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 you've enjoyed these books, if you continue to enjoy listening to them, if you appreciate what I'm doing and what we're doing, um, it would it would mean the absolute world if if just to have your support, even even if it's only a um 
a rate and review uh, on iTunes or um, share on Instagram. Share on Instagram, yeah. Please, please do. Um, and and feel free to get in touch with me at any time with any uh, any feedback, any comments, uh, any questions. And don't be scared to start discussions about the stories because Stephen loves stories and talking about their meaning and all that type of stuff. So, and he will he will comment you back and message you back and he will talk to you about them. So, oh yeah, the other thing I was going to say about Patreon, there are uh, rewards available. Um, the 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 basic reward which you will get on every tier includes um, postcard prints of of your actual lovely illustrations that we've just been talking about. So if you if you would like those because they they came out and they look they look really nice they look really beautiful if you love the stories i think they're really nice to have around you could send them to a friend you could you know do whatever you want put them on your wall that's that's a really nice thing and then there's other things as well you know if you if you pay a little bit more you can um have early access to to get the whole audiobook in one go rather than having to wait for the weekly episode um so there are little perks if you go on patreon.com slash willow audiobooks have a little look um you will see um, but yeah, so I'm not uh, I'm not a natural uh, speaker. M- I'm much better at uh, interpreting other people's words. So thank you for putting up with this. Um, hopefully, we'll have some more of these conversations, and they'll get more uh, more streamlined as they go along. Uh, let me know if you've got any ideas of any guests that you'd like me to speak to about different things. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the stories that I've done so far, and I'd also like to talk about stories in general so anyone who um is is interested in that sort of thing uh let me know but yeah thanks so much for listening thank you ben for joining the pops um and yeah here's to the next audiobook bye bye to stay updated with willow audiobooks you can follow us on social media just search for willow audiobooks on instagram facebook and twitter or you can visit our webpage at stephenalexanderwillis.com forward slash Willow Audiobooks. Why not leave a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever you happen to get your podcasts? 